Um, thank you for that kind introduction there and, and, uh, and for the invitation. It gives me great joy to be present here with you at a church dedicated to the angelic doctor. Discovering St. Thomas in senior year of high school, thanks to a great philosophy teacher, was a turning point in my life. It led me to go to Thomas Aquinas College, then to pursue graduate studies in Thomism at Catholic University of America, and finally to spend about 20 years teaching philosophy and theology ad mentem sancti tome, according to the mind of St. Thomas. The study of Aquinas disciplines the mind in, a, in such a way as to render it more receptive to and discriminating of the truth, wherever it may be found and whoever says it. So those of you who are parishioners here, I know that wouldn't be all of you, but you have one of the greatest possible patron saints, and you should pray to him and ask him to send down heavenly wisdom on the church suffering. And by this, I don't mean the holy souls in purgatory. Though, of course, we are praying for them in a special way in this month of November. But the church suffering on earth from a tremendous eclipse of faith and reason, of fervor and religion, that can leave us feeling quite disoriented and demoralized. The angelic doctor is depicted in art with the sun as a shining disc emblazoned on his chest over his heart, emitting beams in all directions. It reminds us not only that he was illuminated for a special and universal mission, but also that the divine light is in fact never absent from us when we are living in God's grace, in his charity. We carry in us the light of reason, faith, and the Holy Spirit, by which we can walk confidently, even in the midst of dark nights and tempestuous times. I had thought of giving this talk a different title, the value of stable adherence or stable attachment to the Latin Mass. But the goal, in any case, would have been the same. To explain to you, as well as I can in the limits of a lecture, the importance of stability, consistency, and good habits in the spiritual life, and how, in a very special way, the traditional Latin Mass is a superior home or environment in which to settle down spiritually and how it can even be harmful to be nomads who do not have a settled liturgical home. The inspiration for my talk comes from the holy rule of St. Benedict, to which, uh, which I have been reading for many years as a Benedictine oblate. The rule is divided into about 122 little pieces, so the whole of it is read three times a year by monks, nuns, and oblates. So you get to be quite familiar with it. It has become a familiar companion, but never ceases to challenge me and give me new things to ponder. Now, the rule makes a big deal out of what came to be called later on the practice of, and I would also say the gift of, stabilitas cordis et loci, stability of heart and of place. It means putting down your roots in this particular monastery, not gadding about from one monastery to another, like the so-called gyro vagues Benedict discusses in the opening chapter, of whom he says, quote, these spend their whole lives tramping from province to province, staying as guests in different monasteries for three or four days at a time. Always on the move with no stability, they indulge their own wills and succumb to the allurements of gluttony." Unquote. In contrast, the Cenobites, that is, monks who live in community as brothers, will help one another to achieve their ultimate destiny of heaven, which only the rarest can achieve as solitaries or hermits. Benedict says at the end of chapter 4 of the Instruments of Good Works, he says, but the workshop in which we perform all these works with diligence is the enclosure of the monastery and stability in the community. In chapter 58, the novice promises stability and perseverance. And when the time comes for his full reception, he or she, since we could also be talking about nuns, is asked, asked to promise in the oratory in the presence of all before God and his saints stability the reformation of his life and obedience. In chapter 60, Benedict says that a priest who wishes to join the community can do so, provided he promises to keep the rule and personal stability. 
So you can see this is very much on, on the mind of, uh, of, of St. Benedict. It seems for the holy patriarch that there is something especially important about this vow of stability, of staying put, committing oneself to a place, a house, a community, a definite way of life. It is at the opposite end of the spectrum from what we often see nowadays, a consumerist approach to religion, where people take samples of this or that spirituality from a smorgasbord of options. St. Benedict was drawing upon an already developed tradition of monastic wisdom. For example, St. Antony of the Desert claimed that monastic perfection requires three things, study of the scriptures, prayer, and stability. And not just monks or nuns, but all of us stand to benefit from these three things diligently pursued. Dom Hubert van Zeller, he was Benedictine, English Benedictine, describes stability as, quote, interior constancy, the willingness to counter, both in the mind and in outward conduct, the restlessness which urges change, unquote. Dom Paul de Lat, a successor of Dom Prosper Guéranger at Salem, writes, quote, stability has the precise meaning of permanence in the supernatural family. Stability consists in a deep and lasting belonging to a family, unquote. Although we may truly serve one and the same Lord and fight under the same king in any place or in many places, when we fix ourselves in suitable surroundings, we can serve him better. I will make the case tonight that the Latin Mass gives us precisely those suitable surroundings where we are wise to fix ourselves consistently, steadily, stably, so that we may serve our Lord and King better, building the right habits of prayer and penance, sanctifying our souls more surely. In what follows, I will base my remarks loosely on the structure of Mass, but with some digressions too. So what we're basically, we're going to do a sort of walkthrough of the Mass and think about it from this vantage point. So before Mass, we step into the church and we find it quiet. The people who gather at the Latin Mass do so to pray to Almighty God and to pray for themselves and for one another. They are there, as the Gloria says, to praise, bless, adore, and glorify him, to give him thanks, to beg his mercy, to ask for our needs. The spirit of recollection and meditation, even if occasionally interrupted by crying babies who don't know any better and remind us of our littleness before God and of his love of human life, the spirit of recollection and meditation exists here and can thrive. The ancient liturgy itself, with its alternations of chant and silence, its sacred choreography, and its rich symbols, fosters our prayer, calms our mind, speaks to the heart, responds to us at a deeper level than words, and gives us a peace that the world does not know and cannot give. The prayers at the foot of the altar begin. Introducing a period of focused preparation before the priest climbs the steps to begin the Mass, properly speaking, with the introit or entrance antiphon. Without these prayers at the foot of the altar, we are less prepared than we should be for the Word of God and for the renewal of the Holy Sacrifice. We, we can never be completely prepared, of course, but we must make an effort to be somewhat prepared. The traditional liturgy thoughtfully gives us the opportunity to recollect ourselves in repentance and fear of the Lord and humble dependence on his grace. Mass absolutely should not suddenly start at the chair in the sanctuary as if we've been dropped in by parachute. We have to climb up the hill and the steps to Mount Zion as we read in the gradual Psalms beloved to the Jews on pilgrimage. The priest has now climbed the steps and walked to the epistle side to say the introit. From this point onwards, he will be practically tethered to the altar, as if by an invisible chain of love. The entire liturgy of the Mass from start to finish is the sacrifice of praise we offer to God, at the heart of which is found the sacrifice of Calvary. The priest's constant circulation around the altar and his decisive stance of prayer toward the east remind us 
that we are come here to worship God, not to transact any human business, however noble or necessary it may be. He is the origin of our being and the meaning of our life and the end of our journey. All is oriented to him. There is no more fundamental lesson that the liturgy could ever teach us, and the Latin Mass teaches it powerfully, carrying us out of ourselves toward God without the serious distraction of the priest and lectors facing the people. By watching the priest perform his special office from a certain distance, the gap, as it were, between God's holiness and ours is emphasized, which paradoxically intensifies the fascination of his mystery. Never do we feel more in the presence of God than when we are in a way excluded physically from nearness or familiarity while being liberated to surrender ourselves to prayer, which is actually what unites us to the invisible and the eternal. The priest recites the ninefold Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, in honor of the three persons of the Holy Trinity and the nine choirs of angels in a dialogue with the servers who represent us. Most days he will recite the Gloria, beginning with a rising motion of the hands and bowing his head five times in humble acknowledgement of God. Then he comes to the mighty collect, the prayer that sums up the petitions of Holy Mother Church for that day. He bows toward the tabernacle, then says the prayer with hands raised. The age-old Roman rite exhibits an obviously God-centered and Christ-centered orientation, found both in the common stance of the priest and people ad orientem, toward the east, and in the rich texts of the classical Roman Missal itself, in the order of mass, as well as in its propers that change from day to day. As compared with the modern mass, these ancient texts give far greater emphasis to the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice of our Lord upon the cross. The prayers of the New Missal, when you study them, are often watered down in their expression of dogma and ascetical doctrine, whereas the prayers of the Old Missal are unambiguously and uncompromisingly Catholic. This missal, this old missal, is a pure font of Christian wisdom, not a committee product cobbled together by experts, adjusted to the real or imaginary preferences of modern man. Michael Fiedrowitz, in his masterful book, The Traditional Mass, makes just this point, quote, the celebration of the liturgy in its traditional form constitutes an effective counterweight for all levelings, reductions, dilutions, and banalizations of the faith. Many who are unfamiliar with the classical liturgy and are acquainted only with the recreated form believe that what they see and hear there at the Novus Ordo is the entirety of the faith. Scarcely anyone senses that central passages have perhaps been removed from biblical pericopes, passages, Scarcely anyone notices that the church's orations no longer expressly attack error, no longer pray for the return of those who have strayed, no longer give the heavenly clear priority over the earthly, make the saints into mere examples of morality, conceal the gravity of sin, and identify the Eucharist as only a meal. Scarcely anyone even knows what prayers the church said over the course of centuries in place of the current preparation of the gifts, and how these prayers demonstrated the church's understanding of the mass as a sacrifice offered through the hands of the priest for the living and the dead." Unquote. You see, the differences between the old mass and the new mass are far-reaching, indeed radical, as in going down to the root, and this at two different complementary levels. On the one hand, what we see and hear, the artistic or aesthetic dimension, what some refer to as smells and bells, and on the other hand, what the texts themselves say and do not say. This is more a question of content. If we look at the content, we find the kind of differences Fiedrowitz just described. The fullness of the Catholic faith in all of its doctrine, morality, and spirituality is found only in the traditional Latin Mass, this can be and has been demonstrated. 
in a plethora of studies, including my own articles and books. So I go into this kind of stuff on a regular basis. I, that is in detail, pointing these things out. If we look at the form or the externals, we see too the perfection of the Tridentine ceremonies and rites with nothing casual, haphazard, sloppy, or unserious, or invented. We see the way the rubrics promote and protect Eucharistic reverence, how they encourage adoration, humility, devotion, and contrition, how they provide so many helps for us to raise our minds to God and our hearts to heaven. As I like to say, the old mass gives us so many pegs on which to hang our thoughts and prayers. Right? This helps us to see, incidentally, that it is quite mistaken to say that the Latin mass excludes the participation of the people. Nothing more stupid can be imagined. And yet it was just repeated. It was just repeated by a certain man dressed in white back in July. And then, like the refrain of a monotonous pop song, got parroted again and again in all the coverage on Tradiciones Custodes. There's no active participation of the people at the old Latin mass, and Vatican II changed all that for the better. Good grief. There is no ignorance as profound as the ignorance of the ecclesiastical establishment talking about the liturgical tradition and the so-called reform. On the contrary, the Latin Mass greatly fosters the meaningful involvement of the faithful by giving us more to enter into and more numerous ways to relate to it. As we continue through the Mass, we are given opportunities to worship with our bodies by kneeling for long stretches by making many signs of the cross, bowing our heads or genuflecting at certain moments. It is altogether more physically demanding, which is very good for us. Our senses are engaged by silence, music, incense, and regimented ceremonies. If we follow along in a missal, our intellects are given dense and nourishing prayers that we can meditate on for the rest of our lives without exhausting their meaning. Refreshingly, the old liturgy accords a certain freedom and dignity to the layman whose baptism has equipped him to be a member of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. The liturgy spreads out a lavish banquet of prayer from which everyone can take all that they please in the way that suits them best. The old mass has a wonderful, mysterious way of adapting itself to the varied needs of all who attend it. So let me give some examples. Some prefer to kneel and watch or count their beads. Others let the music of high mass guide their thoughts and feelings. Still others like to follow every antiphon, prayer, and reading in their well-thumbed daily missal. The mass could say with St. Paul the Apostle, I am become all things to all men that at least some might be saved. To the quiet, it is quiet. To the intellectual, it is inexhaustibly intelligible. To the sentimental, it is stirring and reassuring. But it also makes demands. To the impatient or overly busy, it is a salutary summons to rest and receptivity. To the slothful or passive, it is a provocation to work harder, kneel longer, and pay attention. We come now to the epistle and the gospel. Many people think that the Novus Ordo has a great advantage over the Old Mass because it has so much more scripture. A three-year cycle of Sunday readings and a two-year cycle of weekday readings, and longer and more numerous readings at Mass, instead of the ancient one-year cycle, usually with two readings per Mass, which we call the Epistle or the Lesson and the Gospel. What advocates of the new lectionary do not realize is that the architects of the Novus Ordo took out most of the psalm verses and biblical allusions that formed the warp and woof of the traditional order of the mass. And then, like a concrete mixer, dumped in a giant array of readings with little regard to their congruency with each other or with the fixed parts of the mass. On top of this, they slyly excised difficult passages that might offend or frighten modern people even if these passages had been included in the liturgy for over a thousand years. And we moderns especially need to hear them to shake us out of our complacency. We, we needed more difficult passages, not less difficult passages, not fewer. The word of God is a two-edged sword, 
but the edges had to be blunted to comply with safety regulations. <laughs> in saner times, the sword was allowed to be sharp so that it could cut into our hard hearts and make room for the liberating truth. When it comes to biblical readings, the traditional mass operates on two admirable principles. First, passages should be chosen not for their own sake to get through as much of scripture as possible, but rather to illuminate the meaning of the occasion of worship or to highlight the sanctity of the saints. Far from being merely instructional or didactic, the readings are an integral part of the seamless act of worship offered to God in the holy sacrifice. This is a point that really needs to be emphasized. The clergy utter the divine words in the presence of their author as part of the rational worship we owe to our creator and redeemer. These words are a making present of the covenant with God, a grateful recitation in the sight of God of the truths he has spoken and the good things he has both promised and delivered, and a form of verbal incense by which we raise our hands to his commandments. The mass of the catechumens makes the word present in the words of the prophets, apostles, and evangelists, as the mass of the faithful makes the word present in his body and blood. In both cases, we are standing on holy ground before the burning bush, and the ceremonies with which the word of God is surrounded in the old mass tell us that, tell us about the awesomeness and, and divine nature of the Bible without the need for tedious explanations. Second, the emphasis at Mass should not be on biblical literacy or instruction, but on what could be called a lifelong mystagogy. In other words, the readings at Mass are not meant to be a glorified Sunday school, but an ongoing initiation into the mysteries of the faith. Their more limited number in the Old Missal, brevity, liturgical suitability, and welcome annual repetition makes them a powerful agent of spiritual formation and preparation for the Eucharistic sacrifice. The focus much more naturally rests on the offering of the spotless victim and on his heavenly court of saints to whom the readings point us as they should. We are not a religion of the book, but a religion of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. By drawing us into a deeper union with Christ and pulling us deeper into the mysteries of God, the traditional mass builds in our souls a greater inclination to read and pray with scripture in our personal prayer time outside of mass. At least that, that's been my experience and the experience of many people I know. I never really took the Bible seriously until I got into the traditional liturgy. And then I was like, whoa, where's all this powerful stuff coming from? And then I was like, then it was like oh, okay, it's coming from the Bible. So like, the, 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 there's something about the way it uses scripture that actually hooks you more into the meaning of scripture and the importance of it, the way that it's treated in the liturgy. It might prompt us to start praying the divine office with which the meditative and biblically resonant ancient mass so perfectly harmonizes. As a result, we will no longer be tempted to view the Bible as a chore to be gotten through, but rather as an extension of the union we experience when we assist at holy mass. If mass brings us into the real presence of the beloved, then reading scripture at home is perusing his love letters. First, we need to fall in love, and then we'll want to start up a correspondence. After the readings, the homily and the creed, we come to the offertory. The magnificent old offertory prayers all by themselves have been enough to convince people to quit attending the Novus Ordo, which suppressed those prayers entirely, and to attend the Latin Mass, which has preserved them in their central place for a thousand years of Christendom. As with all developments in the liturgy, the offertory developed because a need was felt for a fuller, more deliberate expression of what the priest is doing at Mass, and why, and for whom. Consider the prayer said by the priest when holding the paten with the bread. It's the prayer, Sushipe Sancte Pater, which strongly brings out his role as mediator in and through Christ, as well as his personal sinfulness in the face of such a lofty role. So here's how the, that prayer reads in translation. Accept, O Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, this unspotted host, which I, thy unworthy servant, offer unto thee by living and true God. 
for my innumerable sins, offenses, and negligences, and for all here present, as also for all faithful Christians, both living and dead, that it may avail both me and them for salvation unto life everlasting. Amen. The old offertory prayers ensure that the priest forms a correct, distinct intention of what he is about to do in the consecration, and more generally, a profound consciousness of the meaning and value of what he is doing in the canon of the Mass as a whole. When we follow the priest's motions, and even more, when we internalize his prayers, we too form a correct, distinct intention for the sacrifice we are offering of ourselves and on behalf of those we love, in union with Christ to the Eternal Father. In the offertory, we offer the host and chalice at the hands of the priest. In the Roman canon, we offer the supreme sacrifice and ourselves along with it. In communion, we are joined with our Lord in the fullest way possible, short of the beatific vision. If you have never looked carefully at the offertory prayers of the traditional mass, I strongly urge you to do so, and then to compare them with what is found in the same place in the Novus Ordo. The comparison is nothing less than shocking, and I do not use that, I do not use that word lightly. Now we come to the canon of the mass. When the priest, instead of reading out the Eucharistic prayer at us, is facing east to offer the canon silently to God for us, it becomes much easier to pray the words of the canon in union with him or to give ourselves up to a wordless union with the sacrifice. This makes the canon of the Mass a time of intensely full, conscious, and actual participation, a pregnant pause in the hustle and bustle of life, an opening through which God enters in a way past all understanding. As the prophet Habakkuk proclaims, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. It may seem that the priest is doing everything and the faithful are doing nothing, but the reality is far different. The disciplined holding of oneself, body and soul, attentive in silence to the heart of the mystery is an eminent way of bringing the whole man into subjection to Christ. Silence is a sort of spiritual prostration of the senses and human faculties in the most climactic moments of the holy sacrifice. Without denigrating the actions, chants, and beautiful things we can and should do in the liturgy, we must acknowledge that there are points when we are simply struck dumb. By accepting these moments of dumbness, we enhance our realization of the unspeakable miracle taking place in the sanctuary. This miracle, the very heart of the Mass, transubstantiation, is necessarily invisible. We do not see the bread changed into flesh, but accept it on faith in the word of Jesus Christ, who can do all things. Nor can we hear with bodily ears the innermost truth of the word made flesh. What is needed above all, then, is not more visibility, but rather help in building and expressing our faith in the mystery. This help, this help to our faith, comes through the only thing that is perceptible in the liturgy, the signs of adoration we offer, the reverence with which we surround the miracle. That's what we can see. That's what we can perceive. In its unmistakable focus on the moment of sacramental sacrifice, visually accentuated with the elevations, the raised chasuble, the bells, and the enveloping silence, the Roman canon, as prayed in the traditional Latin mass, gives the mysterium fidei its due prominence, the mystery of faith. This truly is the font and apex of the Christian life. The silent canon is now over. The Lord's prayer has been said or chanted by the priest. The agnus dei pleads for mercy and peace. The poignant words, Domine non sum dignus ut intres subtectum meum sed tantum dic verbo et senabitur anima mea are spoken six times, thrice by the priest, thrice by the servers. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, but say only the word and my soul shall be healed. The priest receives the holy mysteries while the ministers begin the third confiteor of the mass, 
this time as proximate preparation for daring to approach the holiest of holy things. We kneel at the altar rail, our hands beneath the houseling cloth, our heads tilted, ready to be fed by the Father with the manna come down from heaven, the Son of God, our King, our Judge, our hope of salvation. Here it is appropriate to speak a few words about the reverence we see at the traditional Latin Mass for the Holy Eucharist, which is, hands down, the greatest gift that God gives us in this mortal life. We will see only the priest handling our Lord's Eucharistic body. We will never see lay people walking right up into the sanctuary and handling hosts or chalices. Communion is given to the faithful kneeling in adoration like the Magi before the Christ child. It is given on the tongue as infants are fed by their parents, as God feeds the world with his providence. A paten is held beneath the chin. Often a communion cloth is draped over the altar rail. After communion, the priest washes his fingers and the vessels with utmost care. The liturgy spares no effort to, have, to proclaim loudly the church's faith in the miracle of transubstantiation. It therefore spares no effort to avoid the loss of the tiniest particle of the body of Christ or the smallest drop of his blood. Receiving communion like this and watching others do so educates the faithful more directly and memorably than endless hours of catechesis. Better still, it induces in us the right habits and pulls us far away from the danger of intentional or unintentional sacrilege. The church is very thoughtful to do all of these things for us. Consider the effects in particular on children. The traditional way of celebrating mass most deeply forms the minds and hearts of our children in reverence for Almighty God, especially in the virtues of faith, humility, obedience, and adoring silence. It fills their senses and imaginations with sacred signs and symbols, mystic benedictions, as the Council of Trent puts it. The pioneering Catholic educator Maria Montessori frequently pointed out that small children are very receptive to the language of symbols, often more so than adults are, and that they learn more easily from watching people do a solemn liturgy than from hearing a lot of words with little action. All of this is extremely impressive and gripping for children who are learning their faith and especially for boys who become altar servers. That is the positive side. On the negative side, it is especially harmful for children to witness at the Novus Ordo, at least at some, not all, but most, unfortunately, the appalling lack of reverence with which our Lord and God is treated in the awesome sacrament of his love, as pew after pew of Catholics automatically go up to receive in the hand and standing a gift they all too often treat casually and even with a bored indifference. The church teaches that the Eucharist is really, truly, and substantially our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But then the majority of clergy and laity act in a way that says we are handling ordinary, though symbolic, food and drink. And bishops pretend to be astonished that so many Catholics have an essentially liberal Protestant view of what is going on at Mass or eventually drift away into unbelief. And they shouldn't be surprised. For us and for our children, the safe refuge is once again and always the traditional Latin Mass. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, says our Lord. Let them come into his real presence with utmost reverence. Let them behold him in the ministers he has chosen as other Christs to continue his work at their hands. Let the little children come to know the sight, the sound, the smell of holiness as they watch, listen, and linger in the house of the Father, while the words uttered and sung by countless saints are repeated to heaven's delight and hell's dismay. Let them come before the Lord in solemn joy to experience the peace that surpasseth all understanding. Let them receive abundant gifts from the hands of Jesus and above all the gift of himself. Let them know they are entering into the presence of hosts of angels adoring the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Do not hinder the children by bad liturgy and all of the falsehoods it tells. For example, that there is no great distinction between the nave and the sanctuary, or between the priest and the extraordinary minister when it comes to distributing the divine mysteries. Do not hinder children by masking or blurring the unique dignity of the hands of the priest, 
anointed to handle the most holy body and blood of Christ. Do not hinder them from coming to the Lord by any of the deviations of the Novus Ordo, which is driven by a false theology that undermines the faith of children. And since we are all supposed to convert and become like little children, what is appropriate for their faith is in fact appropriate for ours. We shouldn't have to filter out little doses of poison. We shouldn't have to offer up the distractions, abuses, bad examples, crummy music, and lack of prayerfulness. Mass makes present the sacrifice of Calvary for our salvation so that we can honor our Lord with the best we can give him. It is not supposed to crucify our Lord with irreverence, mediocrity, banality, or heresy. Mass is given to us as a privileged time of communion with God, not as a time of entertainment or a nuisance to be gotten through or a battlefield of trials and temptations. I mean, we can have trials and temptations ourselves that we have to fight through, but the liturgy itself shouldn't be the, the cause of those trials and temptations, right? It's supposed to be an aid, not a, uh, a, 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 um, a punishment, right? Many of the reasons for persevering in and supporting the traditional Latin mass can be summed up in one word, mystery. The liturgical celebrations that bring us into contact with our very God should bear the stamp of his mysteriousness, his indescribable transcendence, his overwhelming holiness, his disarming intimacy, his gentle yet penetrating silence. The traditional form of the Roman rite surely bears this stamp. Its ceremonies, its Latin language, its eastward posture, and its ethereal music are perfectly understandable given what it is, while instilling a sense of the unknown and unknowable, even the fearful and thrilling. By deeply fostering a sense of the sacred in an age of profanity, the old mass preserves intact the mystery of faith and with it the entirety of the Catholic faith. In an era of cancel culture, the traditional Latin Mass, the single greatest monument and embodiment of Western Catholic civilization, stands as a defiant affirmation of culture, which is rooted in the cultus or worship of the divine. After communion has been distributed, the priest returns to the altar to cleanse the vessels. There might be music or there might be silence. The Mass ends with the priest singing or saying the post-communion prayer, giving thanks to God, imparting a final blessing on the kneeling faithful, and reading the sublime prologue of John's Gospel, a perfect summation of the meaning of what we have just done, the word that enlightens all men who come into the world, the word that enlightened us in the antiphons, prayers, and readings of the Mass. This word has become flesh and has indeed dwelt among us in our midst full of grace and truth, and we have brushed up against his glory, touched the hem of his garment to be healed, even if we have not yet beheld him face to face. After the mass is finished and the Leonine prayers have been said by all, or some music has been sung or played at a high mass, an atmosphere of silence descends once more upon the church, but this time a silence that is filled with content like a sponge saturated with water, or like the rest after a time of concentrated activity. It complements and completes the expectant and respectful silence that preceded Mass. The end is joined to the beginning. While all things were in quiet silence and the night was in the midst of her course, thine almighty word, O Lord, leapt down from heaven from thy royal throne, says the Book of Wisdom. That's the text of the introit for the Sunday within the octave of Christmas. The first coming of Christ was in humility. The second coming will be in glory and judgment. But in between, he comes to us in mystery, hidden under the forms of bread and wine, hidden in our hearts where faith is his entrance and love his welcome. Should we not fight hard and do whatever it takes to preserve this faith intact, and to increase this love more and more. Having spoken about the Mass itself, I would like to say a few words about the shape of the Catholic liturgical year. 
One of the most significant differences between the traditional and modern missiles is their respective calendars, which have all kinds of trickle-down effects. In 1969, the Novus Ordo was rolled off the assembly line with a calendar very different from the Tridentine one, with the justification that this new calendar better accentuates the so-called temporal cycle, namely the annual run-through of the mysteries of Christ, beginning with Advent, moving into Christmas, then Lent, and finally Easter, culminating in Pentecost. That's what's meant by the temporal cycle. Ironically, however, the traditional Roman calendar is far richer in its temporal cycle, giving more weight to certain key seasons, such as Christmas and the time after Pentecost, and featuring a number of special times that bring out more fully the meaning of each part of the grand cycle, such as the season of Epiphany, the period of Septuagesima, and the short Ascension Tide. All of these are absent from the Novus Ordo calendar. Instead of juggling a lectionary with multiple years, the old rite follows a strict annual cycle. In other words, each year you get the full array of that, of that year's Sundays and feast days with unchanging texts and chants. Thanks to this stable cycle, each Sunday has a distinct and memorable character, the annual recurrence of which makes it more and more familiar, so that, as I was saying earlier about the readings, it really becomes part of you as long as you're consistent in attending so that you can reap these lifelong benefits, these long-term benefits. The traditional calendar has the poetry and the power to structure our secular lives, to become the framework of our lives, something I have never observed happening with the Novus Ordo calendar. And if I could make a little pitch here for a fantastic new product from Sophia Institute Press, you will definitely want to check out the illustrated liturgical year calendar, a set of 18 by 24 inch full color wall posters that are sent out every quarter in sets of four with exquisitely detailed and beautiful artwork illustrating every day and season of the traditional Catholic calendar. There's never been anything like it before. You have to check this out. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It will really help you to enter more fully into the church's year of grace. To be honest, I cannot imagine, so this is all for the traditional calendar. I can't imagine the Novus Ordo calendar inspiring the kind of work that this calendar is that I just described to you. Check it out, you'll see what I mean. In addition to its rich sanctoral cycle, which features over 300 more saints at mass, it's a pretty impressive number, the Tridentine calendar has ancient observances like ember days four times a year and rogation days that heighten our gratitude to God and our appreciation of the goodness of creation. There is no such thing as ordinary time, a most unfortunate phrase. Instead, we have time after Epiphany and time after Pentecost, extending the meaning of these great feasts like a long afterglow. The traditional calendar has the pre-Lenten season of Septuagesima, which beginning three weeks before Ash Wednesday deftly aids in the psychological transition from the joy of Christmastide to the sorrow and penance of Lent. Lent itself yields to Passiontide, when all images are covered in violet veils and the liturgy loses a number of its customary prayers, reminiscent of the stripping away of Christ's garments to humiliate him. Passiontide leads into Holy Week and finally the Triduum, where, in addition to the main liturgies, the haunting services of Tenebrae take place. After Easter and its octave, Paschal Tide culminates in Ascension Tide, followed by Pentecost. In company with Christmas and Easter, Pentecost, a feast of no lesser status or antiquity than Easter and Christmas, is celebrated for a full eight days, a full octave, so that the church may bask in the warmth and light of the heavenly fire. Like most other features of the Usus Antiquior, the aforementioned aspects of the calendar are extremely ancient and connect us vividly with the church of the first millennium and even the earliest centuries. Why did they take all of this away? There's no good reason for that at all. All this may sound complicated, the calendar, and in a way it is, it's meant to be. We have to bear in mind that the historic liturgies of Christian peoples have always had features like this, like these. What is unusual is not to have a rich calendar of saints and seasons, feasts and fasts. 
The fact that so many books are now appearing on how to recapture the calendars of Catholics from the stranglehold of secularism and infuse positive Christian meaning into the rhythm of the year, I'm sure you've seen these, every publisher has these books now, is a sign that we have lost our religious and liturgical bearings and feel the need to recover them. The Catholic Church had already figured all of this out a long time ago. Our job today is to unearth the treasure buried through several decades of incompetent management. However complicated the old liturgy may be, it's a good complicated. We don't have to try to master it. We just plug ourselves into it, like countless Christians have done before us. Once we do that, we actually do begin to understand it more, while at the same time realizing that all eternity is not enough to plumb the depths of the mysteries we hope someday to enjoy face to face. Returning now to stabilitas cordis et loci, stability of heart and place. How good it is for us to find an immovable rock and to build our house, our spiritual life on this firm foundation and to not be moved. Of all the natural materials we know in the world, rock is the most firm, the most solid. It can serve as the foundation for everything else because it is stable and unchangeable, relatively speaking. Rocks are ancient. When all else is changing, they abide. This is why scripture speaks of the everlasting hills and Mount Zion, which like the Lord himself shall not be moved forever. Jesus Christ is the rock of the church. He is the rock on which the wise man builds his house so that the rains, floods, and winds cannot sweep it away. He is the living stone rejected by men but chosen and made honorable by God, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and the one who believes in him shall not be confounded. He is the stone rejected by the builders who has become the cornerstone. He is a stumbling stone and a rock of scandal he is the spiritual rock from which the children of Israel drink their fill. The epistle to the Hebrews throws down the gauntlet to the cult of change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As I hope my remarks have at least partially shown, the traditional Latin mass partakes of the very same qualities. Obviously, the mass has undergone organic change over the centuries, but the rate of change has always been slow, one might even say geological. <laughs> and as the mass reached its perfection in the high Middle Ages, the changes slowed to nearly a halt. For a period of 500 years, the mass, and for that matter, the entire liturgical life of the church, was so massive, stable, firm, and secure that we could say of it that it looked and felt and functioned as if it was the same yesterday, today, and forever. In spite of our 50 years of wild liturgical change that brought us innumerable novelties and countless casualties, the old mass has, by God's special providence, remained among us, and year by year it has recovered lost ground. We have learned, to our shame but not to our surprise, that it is impossible to build well on shifting sand or mud or water. But when we, like wise men, build on the rock of the mass, the integral, authentic mass, the unfailing garden of saints handed down to us through the ages in Catholic tradition, our house will be, will be stably founded. And the rains of adversity, the floods of disaster, the winds of crisis, even the vengeful attacks of aged progressives nostalgically stuck in the 60s and 70s cannot sweep it or us away. The liturgy, like its Lord, is a living stone because it comes from the living God and brings his life to us. It can never be considered dead. It is, it is a spiritual rock from which the true Israelites drink their fill. The Tridentine Mass was the cornerstone, elect and precious, of the entire liturgical life of the Roman Catholic Church. And again, like Christ the High Priest, it was rejected by the arrogant builders of a Novus Ordo Missae. But in God's eyes, it will always be chosen and honorable, and those who embrace it shall not be confounded. For liberals, progressives, and modernists, its continued existence, nay, its rather obvious flourishing, is a stumbling stone and a rock of scandal. 
which should tell us something crucial about it and about them. As Bishop Athanasius Schneider likes to say, we should be glad, in spite of any misunderstanding or persecution we may face, to be numbered among the little ones who stay faithful to Jesus Christ, to his blessed mother, to Holy Mother Church, and to the sacred tradition that makes the church Catholic. These little ones stay firmly planted on the rock that is simultaneously and inseparably Christ, the truth, the faith, the papacy, and the mass of ages. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded on a rock. A wholehearted immersion in the mass of the saints, making it our constant point of reference, will help us shake off the dismay, agitation, and feeling of schizophrenia that so often result from bouncing back and forth between different forms of mass, with the different worldviews, priorities, expectations, and habits they embody or encourage. In the spirit of St. Benedict, we need to make the best effort we can to achieve stabilitas loci by binding ourselves to one right one calendar, one community, one coherent Catholic way of life. There's a peacefulness and naturalness that come from knowing what you're supposed to do and what you're going to get. As a layman, there is nothing more consoling and conducive to prayer than showing up at a traditional mass and simply being able to rely on the sameness of everything that will happen from start to finish. Everything for the glory of God and the sanctification of the people, even in the humblest conditions. One can surrender to the Mass, to prayer, to the Lord. Wherever you find yourself in the world, the Latin Mass will be the same. What a blessing to step into a church and find a prayerful atmosphere with the comfort of flickering candles and the lingering scent of incense. A bell rings, the priest comes to the altar and commences his prayers. Perhaps there is chanting too, or just the pervasive silence of many Catholics praying side by side, focused on the one thing necessary. Suddenly, it does not matter where you are on the face of the earth. Deep down and all around, the Mass is the same, descending like a balm on all who are present. In contrast to the infamous optionitis of the Novus Ordo, its plethora of options, whereby each celebration in the manner of a chameleon takes on the color of the celebrant or the community, the traditional mass is ever the same. It forms us instead of us forming it. The mass should never be at the mercy of a priest or held captive by a parish. It is a, it is a mystery far older, far younger, and far greater than we are. And we ought to subordinate ourselves to its pattern and power Ours should be the attitude of St. John the Baptist who said, he must increase and I must decrease. He, the Eucharistic Lord, must increase and I, the ego of the priest or the collective ego of the people, must decrease. We should follow the excellent policy of St. John the Baptist and choose the mass that will, that will intensify our union with the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. If we can do it, if the conditions of our life allow for it, we ought to make a decisive break with pluralism, excessive variety, options galore, and give ourselves simply, completely, and bravely to the traditional worship of the Catholic Church. We know that we are touching the seamless garment of Christ handed down to us over the course of so many centuries, lovingly embellished by each passing generation. The traditional mass is in truth a gift from heaven, one that we could never deserve, one that will never ever pass away as long as the world endures. It is time now for us to yield ourselves up to it and to know a peace that surpasseth understanding. Thank you for your kind attention. The microphone is open. <clears throat>
Sounds good. Well, it's not, it's not really Im impossible to imagine a, an alternative history in which the church had vernacularized the mass, but in our history, she never did that. Um, and I, I think that the reason was that there are certain things that happened at certain points of history for practical reasons or, or for convenience. Um, the use of Latin initially was um, I mean, the, the, the way that the Latin of the Mass is written is a very elegant, rhetorical, and advanced Latin in many cases, so it's not like the vulgar language of the streets. Uh, it, it was never that. It was never the vernacular in the simple sense of the word. But it was certainly chosen initially because it was a, it was a suitable vehicle for communicating the liturgy among fourth century Christians um, in Rome and then further into the north as the barbarians were evangelized, right? They, they, didn't, they couldn't possibly have translated the liturgy into medieval German and French. It would have been kind of a disaster. So it, it, the Latin, the, the, the unanimity of Latin for all Roman Catholic worship was something that came about, you might say, for a variety of practical reasons. But as it lasted for century after century after century after century, it began to acquire a symbolic value as well. It began to acquire, it was partly what I was talking about in, the, in, the, in, in, in my talk, that it, when you step into a church and you hear the Latin of the Mass begin, it immediately puts you into a sacred and prayerful atmosphere and environment, and it, it, it makes you think, I'm not in the outside world anymore, I'm in a special domain. And that instinct, that instinct to have what's called a sacred or sacral language, is something that's common to all religions. The Jews prayed in Hebrew long after Hebrew was the language that they were speaking. As you probably know, Christ was speaking Aramaic, but they still were praying in Hebrew because they kept a sacred language. The, the Greek Orthodox still use ancient Greek, Koine Greek. They don't use modern Greek. Um, the, the Muslims, if we want to go outside Christianity, they use classical Arabic, which is uh, you know, a, quite a complicated language. Um, the, uh, the Hindus and Buddhists have sacred languages. Everybody, the Anglicans use, at least the, the ones that are traditionally minded, they use Elizabethan English, right? So there seems to be this natural sense of the, the language of worship should be exalted and elevated and even a bit strange, a bit remote. So that's one thing. The other point is that the, 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 the actual text of the Latin Mass is something that you get used to over time. It's not that long. It's not like a Bible's worth of text in Latin. It's something that can be printed in a, in a small booklet, right? So you, be, you become accustomed to it by going to it. And I think, you know, um, like you just have to look at little kids. Little kids are great sort of bellwethers or weather vanes or whatever. You know, when, uh, just watch how the little kids belt out all the songs in Latin. You know, they, they, they've got the Salve Regina, the Tantum Ergo, the, the Gloria, whatever it is, they've got it memorized, you know. Um, and so I, I, think, I think we should give ourselves also more credit for, for what we can rise to um, and not think that the liturgy has to kind of come down to our level in that sense. Um, there's more that can be said. I think that that if we look at the example, so let me take the example of Israel. Um, again, I'm sure you know this, that, that the, the Hebrew language had pretty much disappeared as, a, as any kind of spoken language. It was just a scholarly language. But it was revived by the Zionists, and it was made into the daily spoken language of Israel. That's an amazing accomplishment. That happened 100-something years ago. 100, what is it, 150 years ago? I forget exactly when it was. But not, what was that? It, yes. Yeah, so, so la languages, yeah, and in fact, the Catholic Church, up until the Second Vatican Council, was still conducting many of its classes in Latin for the seminarians. That's why all the, all the bishops and, and religious superiors who went to the Second Vatican Council could talk to each other in Latin, right? It's been pointed out that it would be almost impossible to have an ecumenical council anymore. There's no common language. Even English is not a common language, and it's not an adequate theological language for, for the kind of things that would need to be discussed. So what I, the point I want to make is if Catholics loved their heritage, they would take more seriously the teaching and the learning of Latin as well. 
And maybe it's true that for some of us who are older, maybe, you know, we kind of missed the, 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 what's the expression, you know, the ship left or whatever. You know, we, we've, we, we might have missed our opportunity to learn Latin, or, although I don't think it's, you're ever too old to learn a language. But why wouldn't we be teaching this in our schools, you know? And I know for a fact that many homeschoolers teach some Latin. So I, I think we have to think more in terms of like, what is the value of our tradition? And how much do we care about it? And then we'll do what the Jews did and what the Muslims do and what everybody else who takes their religion seriously does and educate, educate, educate. Right? And finally, just one last comment. We all, we can, we're all literate. Uh, we're in a world where there's, you know, whatever, 90-something percent literacy, although that probably will go down as time goes on. Uh, and, uh, and almost everybody can read a missile, and it's just not hard to use one after a certain point. So there's really not a linguistic barrier, absolutely speaking, right? There's always a way. Yes. So how is there any plan oh, for how uh, nationally and internationally so that people can come in safe? Mm -hmm. I mean I, I do th I do think that almost everywhere that the Latin mass exists there, there are some people who are eager to promote it, to advertise it, to invite people to it personally. Um, I think we could all do that better. I mean, just I, I think that that you know, just like Catholics often don't sit in the front pews, but only in the back pews. You know, uh, although tonight this is pretty good distribution. You know, uh, but but I, I think also sometimes Catholics are kind of content with what they have, and they don't think in missionary or evangelistic terms. And we should be thinking in those terms. I mean. With, with something like this. I mean, not, not that we want to get on people's nerves, but just gen, you know, gentle invitations and, and encouragement um, to, to come and experience the liturgy, you know, and, and just to tell people, like, don't try to follow along with it. Just, just watch, just absorb it, you know, just get a sense of how people worshiped for the whole history of the church until recent times, you know. So I, I, do, th I do think that, but now we're in, a, we're, in, we're in an even more challenging situation because the Latin Mass movement has been organically growing now for, well, for 50 years, actually. It's been a steady upward growth. If you, if you had like a chart of the number of masses that's been growing everywhere in the world, it's found in 92 countries right now. It's not just an American phenomenon or just a French phenomenon. Um, but, you know, the recent motu proprio of Pope Francis uh, throws a curveball, you know, in, into this whole affair. Um, because now it makes bishops nervous about the growth of this movement, uh, which is it, it's just such an, it's such an ironic thing. It's like, oh, there's a sector in the church where, you know, there's growth and vocations and lots of children. We've got to do something to stop this, you know? Like, it, it's, it's complete absurdity, you know? Uh, but that's because it's ideology. It's ideology that's driving this. It's a hatred of, of a non-modern, pre-modern, and in some respects, anti-modern way of thinking. That's, that's, the, that's what we're dealing with, an ideological vision. And as you know, ideologues will, would rather kill six million citizens or more, 15 million citizens, uh, in, in the name of their ideology than give up the ideology and let those people live and flourish, right? That's, that's the way these people are. So the growth that was happening naturally is going to become sort of bumpy now. And it's going to, it's go, it's going to be um, maybe more like plants trying to force their way through the cracks in the bricks, in between the bricks, right? Um, so I just, I'm just saying that because it's not as easy suddenly for us to say, hey, everybody, you know, you mentioned there are how many Catholic churches in the city? Yeah, so I, would, I can tell you for sure 
that if the motu proprio hadn't come out, that each of those parishes, as the years go on, would have the Latin Mass. That, that I, I have no doubt about that. Almost all of them would end up with it by this organic process, um, but I don't think that's going to happen right away. I think that's going to take more time now. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there's, um, I'll just mention this briefly. There's a chapter in my book, I'll, I will answer your question. There's a chapter in my book called Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright that is called something like sorting out questions of liturgical allegiance. And I go into this, somebody had asked me the question, you know, ba basically a similar question to yours, and I tried to give some principles for discerning what's the best strategy in, in that kind of situation. But what I... What I have found in my own experience, so maybe I, I should just talk about that because I, I, at least I know my own experience, um, is that I was, I was going back and forth for a number of years between the traditional mass and the Novus Ordo, actually for quite a few years, and I was providing music for both of them. Um, and it worked, it worked well for me for a while because I was really absorbed in the sacred music, in the chant and the polyphony and, and so on. And therefore, my attention had was kind of resting in the music, and the music was beautiful, and therefore the form of the liturgy mattered less to me. But a as time went on, it began to, to kind of bother me more and more, like the, the really striking juxtapositions, and I wasn't even in a bad parish. Um, just some, some, the more subtle things really begin to grate on you, some of the things that I mentioned in, in my talk, like the calendar differences and things like that. So what I discovered is that it was actually more, it seemed to be more fruitful to me, spiritually, to pray the old office, to go to the old mass, and then on days when I didn't have access to it, to pray something from the breviary. I mean, I try to pray something from the breviary every day, but uh, it's, it, there are other forms of prayer that are nourishing, and sometimes Catholics have a tendency to put all their eggs in one basket. It's like, it's the mass or nothing. Like, it's almost like sometimes the mass is the only thing we do as Catholics. And that's actually part of the reason why it's been abused so much, because nowadays, whenever Catholics are going to get together to do something, they have to have a mass. Well, there are a lot of situations where that's, that's not appropriate. You won't be able to do a good job, a fitting job of, of that, you know, in the middle of a picnic field or something like that. You know? um, so I think what Catholics need to rediscover is they need to rediscover the liturgical prayer of the breviary, the divine office, the rosary, obviously. Um, I mean, the, the, and uh, yeah, no, uh, Singing at home, you know, some some people are scared about that. But if if you're but if you're open to singing and you enjoy singing, you know, singing some Latin hymns before bedtime, like Compline. I you know I used to chant, and in my family we would do like a short version of Compline in Latin, uh, and we did it for so many years that the, the the kids were really upset if we ever skipped it, and they knew all the Latin stuff long before they knew what it meant. You know, um, so that's what I mean is that. It's good to, to get creative and to think of other ways to pray that are more harmonious with one another, if I can put it that way. Yes. Yeah, so in my talk at one point, you, you remember early on, I said that the content of the two missiles is different, not just the externals, because of course the externals of the liturgy, you can, I mean, with effort and with knowledge and with a favorable bishop, you can actually emulate a lot of the external aspects of the traditional mass at the Novus Ordo, right? I'm sure you're all aware of that. That happens in this diocese. And some of my criticisms might not be applicable to this diocese or to places in this diocese because you have generally better clergy, at least from what I've been told. Um, but 
the content is the, pro is, is the deeper problem. The fact that the prayers themselves, the modern prayers, have been carefully edited to reflect a late 1960s point of view. And that's, that's not a, a theory, that's a fact. Right? It's been demonstrated to the nth degree. Um, let me just give you a statistic that's kind of interesting. Only 13% of the orations, the prayers of the old missile, made it into the new missile intact. Only 13%, right? Um, that's not continuity, right? <laughs> that's the, that's, it's that kind of information that, when I say orations, I mean the collect, the secret, and the post-communion, or what they now call the, the collect, the prayer over the, the offerings, and the prayer after communion. Those three prayers, that's what I'm talking about. That, those, are, that, those three prayers are like, they're pivotal prayers in the Roman rite. And only 13% of the old ones made it into the new missile. I mean, I don't know about you, but if, if, if somebody said, you know, uh, um, oh, you know, this is the same product, um, except that 87% that of it isn't the same. I mean, I would say, like, what are you trying to pull one over? I mean, you know, this is, this is not, this is, these are two different rights. They're not the same right. And the changes are in the direction of, of downplaying sort of things that were deemed unpalatable. So, so self-denial, fasting, asceticism, um, you know, making heaven a priority over earth, um, you know, ask, uh, praying for heretics to be converted to the true faith, you know, all this sort of stuff, uh, it's just almost gone in the Novus Ordo, right? So think about the effect that that's going to have after dec decade after decade after decade of people hearing these prayers that have been denuded of their content, of their substantial dogmatic content. Um, so yeah, so th that's, that's where you, that's the kind of thing that really makes you realize that the, the, the liturgical reformers are not our friends, right? Because, because nobody, Catholics, unless they were already pretty well educated and they were gonna dig into these, and to study these things the way I've done and the way other people in the movement have done, you know, you could just go to, to church and go to mass and just assume that everything that's being read to you is just fine. And it's, of course it's not only fine, but it's, it's gotta be sufficient, right? I mean, it's a balanced diet, it's gotta be a balanced diet. And then you discover that it's not. <laughs> and, and, and what if you never discovered that, right? Um, so I think it's a, it's a serious, it's a really a serious issue. And I think, I th and that's why, um, that's why we need, we need to be really consistent. Thank you. Um, so um, I'll try to frame this question, but um, so my first experience with the Latin Mass, I was just a young man, maybe in my early 20s, and um, I uh, had a, a desire to go to Mass that day um, and was uh, falling away from the church at the time and trying to at least, and um, was struck with the need to go to Mass and not knowing it was Holy Thursday that day. And, so I went, looked up the yellow pages, and went to the close to the church. I was traveling across country and um, walked into a Latin mass, didn't know it at the time. Wow. And I was uh, dumbfounded. I, I, had, I could see there was a lot of monks at this particular abbey in Southern California, and their mouths were moving, and there was this sound coming out of their mouths, and I didn't even know what that was called. And I was a cradle Catholic. I was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm. Like, um, like finding a Rembrandt in the dumpster. Yeah, yeah. And and this this divide that it exists between the traditional Catholic and um, the Novus Ordo Church, do you find there's a way? You know, a lot of the Novus Ordo Catholics, if you can call them that, um, don't really understand this anger mm -hmm. and this loss. And um, how do we? Um, I guess heal it. How do we? Mm -hmm. together as possible to see, like we said, that biological solution to that problem? Yeah. Um, or is there any way to bridge that um, to help them see um, what is so painful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly true that a lot of people react with feelings of anger or betrayal or, or, or deep sadness, um, you know, when they, when they realize that you know, it's it's as if the church had this enormous treasure chamber, and then um, and then you know, uh, um, and then and then you know, bolted a huge 
iron door against it and put up all kinds of locks and said never again you know something like so we there there's definitely i mean when we realize that we 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 can see that something has has gone grave gone seriously wrong um i i think i don't know this could be superficial i wish i had a better answer it's but i don't think it's superficial um i i've only been able to, to find healing in prayer i mean i just that's the only place i can find it and going to mass Singing the chant for me, I'm a singer, so that, that's very important. So singing chant is very healing for me. Hearing chant is, is healing for me. Um, I think what it does is it sort of calms you down and puts you in the presence of God and makes you turn to him and recognize that he's the only one who can actually ultimately clean up this mess, right? I mean, there's, that's, we're not quietists. That means we don't sit on our chairs and never do anything. That's what the quietists said. You know, God's going to do everything. You don't have to do anything. That's, a, that's an error. But, but ultimately speaking, even for us to get up off of our chairs and do something is God's work, right? God is always the one working the good. Um, and he's the only one who has the power to draw the church back to her own tradition. I think it's, it's an astonishing witness to, when you look at the Bible, when you look at the history of salvation, God is frequently letting people mess themselves up very deeply. Like it just happens over and over again. It's like a, you know, a, a pattern. And, and he really, and he, that's because although he's calling us to salvation, he's, we are not puppets, we're not automatons, he's not manipulating us, he's, he's respecting our free will. He's, it's like he's saying, if you want to smash the car into the brick wall, I, I don't recommend it, I really don't, but you, but you can do that, you know? And so that's, what, that's what's happened. The church, the church, I think in many cases, for, with good intentions, the church in the 1960s got swept up in the in the the naive optimism of the post-war period and really believed that a new world was being born a world of dignity and peace and harmony and fraternity and all this stuff and like this whole renewed brand of catholicism like the company brought out the new coke you know or whatever brought brought out the whole new brand and it flopped just dramatically right um and there hasn't been the kind of business sense yet at the top to say, oh, you know, maybe it was the new Coke. That's the problem. We need to go back to the old recipe. You know, that's, that's what we need to do. But for those of us who have been given a grace, tradition, discovering tradition is a grace. It's a grace from God. It's not something that we merited. It's not something that was owed to us. It's that God said, I want you to know this. I want to give this gift to you. And, you know, and with that comes a responsibility. I mean, not like we're supposed to freak out, but with it comes the responsibility of, okay, thank you for this gift, and, you know, please help me to cultivate it. Please help me to, to benefit from it, to derive the most I can from it, and to pass it on to other people, right? Um, and so in that sense also, like, doing something to promote it and being grateful for, what, for the blessings we have are also healing in, in the same way. Wonder if you can speak to the difference differences in the role of the scholas and choir between the two masses. Yeah, um, so in the in the if you look at the history of the liturgy, the role of a scola of cantors and and trained singers and a gr the group that's called the scola, scola cantorum, um, it was an, it was a role that was always present and crucial to the liturgy. That is to say. Let me put it this way. The liturgy began as a sung phenomenon. The liturgy was not, it did not start as a whispered low mass, uh, although the whispered low mass is beautiful in many circumstances, but it, it began as a chanted liturgy because that's what all ancient cultures do. They chant their religious texts and they chant their ceremonies. Um, and so as the, as the rites became more and more complex, which, and there was a big moment there with the edict of, of Milan and with the freedom of the church under Constantine, Suddenly in the fourth century, Christians were able to build churches. They were able to build grand basilicas. The emperor was building them grand basilicas, right? Um, and so they were able, there was a great expansion of liturgy in the fourth century, uh, and, and therefore also an expansion of the role of music in it. And it just seems like as the centuries went on, some of the music stayed simple. That was the stuff for the priest to sing. The priest doesn't have to sing anything very complicated. The preface is the most complicated thing a priest ever has to sing. And that's because you can't assume that a priest is going to have a fantastic voice. So you just give him simple things to sing. And the parts that the people sang 
we're even simpler, not because we're not good singers, but because if you want a hundred or a thousand people to say to sing something together, it should be simple, right? It can't be complicated. So like like uh, like et cum spiritu tuo. When we sing that, everybody can sing it together unanimously. But other parts of music became really elaborate, and that's why you had to have the trained singers in the scola. But again, the thinking was not that they were there for entertainment. They weren't there for, as an embellishment, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we sang these texts? They were there performing an essential function that they only could perform, and it's part of the liturgy, right? That's so important. In the, in the Novus Ordo, what's happened is, well, okay, one, one other point. In the Middle Ages, the low mass developed. The low mass developed as a way for individual priests, especially monks, to celebrate a daily private mass out of devotion for their own spiritual life, for their own spiritual benefit, and also to, to fulfill requests for masses for the dead, for example. So low mass is developed, but where the low mass existed, it didn't replace the high mass. It was just in addition to the high mass. So it's a problem to get to a point which was happened in the 19th, 20th centuries, probably even prior to that, where there were many Catholics who were only ever going to low mass. That's, that's a, that's a, that is a deviation because the mass is a sung thing and it's meant to be sung. Singing the high mass, the solemn high mass, is the fullest form of the rite. The low mass is basically a private mass for a priest uh, for his devotional purposes. Um, so already when Vatican II met, there was a problem because that, that Vatican II tried to address, which is the problem of not having enough singing at mass. But what they did, or what they set in motion, was a process that just made singing at mass just a bunch of ornamental stuff that you can add at different points, either to give the people something to do, or to, or to get a great choir to sing pretty things, but not things that are from the liturgy, but things that are just like sort of pious texts, but not from the liturgy. Um, so in that sense, optional. So a lot of music has become optional, and it's become, um, f and it, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. It, it, it's not integral to the liturgy. Whereas in the traditional liturgy, there's music that's integral to it that you have to sing. And, and I'm telling you, as a musician, that's fantastic. It, it makes your life so much easier to know. I can show up, literally, I can show up five minutes before Mass. I don't even need to know who the priest is. I don't even have to talk to him. I know everything I'm supposed to sing, and he knows everything he's supposed to sing, right? That's beauty, that's, that's magnificent, right? With the Novus Order, you have to have like a powwow and say like, what are you gonna sing, what am I gonna sing? But you know, all this, and you put up the numbers and all this kind of stuff. So I, I just, just say it's really, it's a profound difference in the conception of music. Yeah. And this will be our last question. Mm -hmm. so how do we, where do we go? Yes. Yeah, so the, the first thing I would say is, is with Bishop Athanasius Schneider that it's not the faithful Catholics. The Catholics are faithful to tradition who are the schismatics, but the modernists and the, and the progressives and the liberals. They're, they're, the ones, they're, they're the ones who have removed themselves from the Catholic Church by not believing what the Church teaches. And I, I'm not exaggerating with that. I mean, there's a blog out there well, I, there are several blogs out there where you can read this. Um, they, they openly dissent from the dogmatic decrees of the Council of Trent. Right? There's, it, the heresy is, is obvious at this point. Those people are not the ones who get to define what it means to be Catholic, okay? Period, basta, end of the story. Um, but as far as obedience is concerned, you know, obedience is a noble virtue that gets dragged through the mud by a lot of, 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 uh, of fictitious uh, uses. Um, Obedience is to be given intelligently, freely, conscientiously, with a clean conscience, with an upright conscience, based on the definitive um, uh, markers and principles that we have from Catholic tradition. So obedience doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not just, yes, sir, whatever you say, sir, you know, that's what, it, but, but it's, it's the kind of obedience that befits the dignity of a rational creature <laughs> and a son of God. And so obedience exists hierarchically. So Everyone, so anybody who's a superior view, himself has a superior. And that chain goes up to God. It doesn't stop at the Pope. It doesn't stop at the bishop or whoever. 
And it's, it's, God is at the, at, the, at the beginning of that in several ways. He is the author of the natural law. Um, he is the author of the divine law, things that have been revealed. And in a certain sense that's very important, he's the author of ecclesiastical tradition as well. Because every generation of Catholics prior to our time would have said that the development of the liturgy and the history of the church was the work of divine providence and of the Holy Spirit. It was not a bunch of human beings making tons of mistakes that had to be undone in the 1960s, right? So I think when you say, should we be obedient, you, you have to ask, like, what's the larger and richer context for that question? And that's what I just tried to sum up in just a few words, right? But I do actually, I have a little book coming out about, uh, in February from Sophia Isdu Press, uh, about, it's called um, True Obedience in the Church, a guide for Catholics, a guide for discernment in challenging times, something like that. And if you, it's, it's an expanded, extended version of the talk I gave at the Catholic Identity Conference uh, last month, the beginning of October, October 2nd, I think I gave the talk. Um, and, and so that talk, the video of that talk is on YouTube, so you might wanna look it up. But the expanded version of it, with lots of juicy footnotes about canon law and stuff, is coming out in February. So, so I, that's a really important question, and that's why it needs to be addressed. So, so thank you very much.